Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, please. In a few moments, we're going to begin the service, but we'd like everyone just to find their seats. And if we could have Alan's children and their spouses in the first row. So if we can have the children and their spouses in the first row, then everyone else can gather around by the family. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're going to begin the funeral service of Mr. Alan Richard Edelson. For those of you who are here, please take a moment to be sure that your cell phones have been silenced, and we welcome those of you who are joining us via live stream. Rabbi Stephen Stark Lowenstein from Am Shalom will be officiating, but before the religious portion of the service, we are humbled and honored to have the honor guard from the United States Marines for taps and flag presentation. Please rise.
So you received this flag on behalf of the President of the United States and a very grateful nation for your dad's amazing service to our country. And so you look to this flag, we look to this flag for strength, for someone who truly loved this country and for all the good that this country represents. And now the military honors have been bestowed upon your dad and so we begin the religious ceremony. We begin the religious ceremony with making a small little tear in a ribbon to remind us of our hearts that are torn. Even the best seamstress in the world would not be able to repair this ribbon without leaving a mark. The three of you and everyone here, everyone on live stream will always feel an incredible tear in your heart. For our hearts that are torn, we perform this act of Kriya. And I ask you to repeat after me these words, Baruch, Ata, Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech, Ha'ulam, Dayan, Ha'emet. We praise you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, Dayan Ha'emet, for it's God's judgment that has taken him at this time. And we accept that. You may return to your seats and please be seated. Shiviti Adonai, Lenagdi Tamir, I have set the eternal always before me. God is at my side, I shall not be moved. Therefore, does my heart exalt, my soul rejoice. My being is secure. For you will not abandon me to death nor let your faithful ones see destruction. You show me the path of life. Your presence brings fullness of joy. Enduring happiness is your gift. Death has taken our beloved Alan Richard Edelson. Our friends grieve in their darkened world. In their silence, there is lamentation. In their tears, there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O God, be with them. For Alan's love that united us in life, which death cannot sever. For his companionship that we shared along life's path, which now continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of his heart and mind that brought us joy and happiness, and is now a precious, precious remembrance. For all these and more, we give our thanks to God. We extend our deepest condolences to a most remarkable, most beautiful family to Diane, to Stephen and Carol, Lisa and Scott, to Nancy and Michael. Alan was so incredibly proud of all of you and hung on for mom for as long as he possibly could and hung on for all of you because he so loved family. He so loved being together, which is why I firmly believe that after an amazing Passover Seder, two of them, he was able to let go with almost all family present for almost all accounted for. He was able to find the freedom that he so, that he so needed, that he so earned. He let go peacefully and gently. And it was his grandchildren that brought him so, so much love and so much joy to Sammy and Andy and Juliet, to Jeremy and Johnny and Helen, to Sam and Billy and Mikey and Erica and Lizzie and Jason and Jenny and Will and Joey and Harry. All of you stepped up into that role as grandchild with the fullness of your hearts. Every step along the way, he was so proud and he wanted nothing more than just to, to be in your presence, to talk with you and to feel your love. To family members and friends, to those who are here present, to those who are on the live stream, to an incredible team of caregivers, to all of us gathered here, to extended family. We feel, we feel your pain. We feel your loss. We find comfort from the words of our tradition. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My help comes from God, maker of heaven and earth. God will not let your foot give way. Your protector will not slumber. See, the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian. God is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. God will guard your soul. Your going and coming, now and forever. No matter what faith tradition we, we may be from, 
we find comfort from one of the 150 psalms. One psalm speaks volumes. It's the 23rd psalm. It reminds us that together we walk together in the valley of the shadow of death. But the psalmist was very clear choosing the words. The psalmist very easily could have written, yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, or we remain in the valley of the shadow of death, or we feel like we're always in the valley of the shadow of death. All of those would be appropriate and would work within the construct of the psalm. But the psalmist, 2,000 years ago, chose the words, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, meaning that there's a before, there's the period that we're going through right now, and then there's a new normal after. And we walk through, and we walk through at our own pace. You don't rush your way through the valley of the shadow. You walk one step at a time, one step with each other, because no one can walk through this valley alone. And so there are so many people that will help you walk this valley, but we walk it together. The words in Hebrew are so beautiful. Together on the service supplement, we join together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. At this hour, the blessed presence of family and friends brings comfort and strength. It says to us, be sure that love, the spring of life, abides. May all who mourn take heart as they remember the goodness they've given and received. And when the days their mourning are ended, may the memory of their loved ones, may Alan's memory truly be a blessing. To the ancient words, we look to modern words as well the beautiful words of Merritt Malloy. When I die, if you need to cry, cry for your brother walking the street beside you. And when you need to give me something, give him what you need to give to me. I want to leave you something, something better than words or sounds. Look for me and the people I've known or loved, and if you cannot give me away, at least let me live in your eyes and not on your mind. You can love me most by letting hands touch hands, by letting bodies touch bodies, and by letting go of children who need to be free. Love doesn't die, people do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. Love doesn't die, people do. And so we hold on to that. We hold on to that love in so many wonderful ways. One of the oldest responsibilities at a funeral would fall on the rabbi. When words were difficult, it fell to the rabbi to be a muturgaman, to be a translator, to use the rabbi's voice to share the voice of others. Stephen, it's my honor to be your maturgamon, to be your translator, to offer your personal words from your heart because words are too difficult to offer now as a mourner. I share them in my voice for you. I would like to thank all of you for coming to this private ceremony. Private in our family seems to have always meant our family plus people who have a relationship with one of the five of us. Today, that number keeps expanding through marriage and friendship, but nonetheless, it would mean a lot to our dad for your being here. I would like to thank Rabbi Lowenstein for the time he spent with both our parents and our family. 
and for being here today. Thank you to his care team, especially Orlando. I saw you just walk in, thank you. Whose two week job turned into a six month, six months of care and friendship. Rabbi Steve and others will talk about my dad and you will hear many things that many of you know. For me, the other family, thoughts of growing up and living with him as a father and friend and teacher are more personal. As you know, these last few years have been difficult for him watching the person who he loved more than anything battle cancer, a broken hip, and then Lewy body dementia. He lived and battled through his pain to make it to dinner almost every night and to see her on most days until the very end. You could always hear the words, I love Diane Barbara. I would like to thank my father for his teachings in so many ways. He taught. He taught that people aren't perfect. And by example, he taught that change is possible. Beginning with our grandparents, he and my mom taught us that the five of us were our own universe. And it has expanded from there. This last Passover, just last week, we were together for two seders. Our mother and father and each of our families, including grandchildren, were present. It was our last supper that ended in the singing of our Fishman Seder song. While the past few years have presented challenging times, they have been navigated by our family. I've had, had the 24 hour support for my two sisters, my wife, my brother-in-laws, and all of the grandchildren, which have allowed him to live with outstanding care and dignity until his very final breath. Then there are all of you, those present, those on live stream, and so many others who, are, who constantly asked what they could do to help or actually just showed up and saw him. I would like to end by saying, as a family, we may not have it all together, but together we have it all. That's a great line. As a family, we may not have it all together, but together we have it all. Thank you to my sisters, to my wife, to Scott, to Michael, to all of the kids. Most of all, thank you, Dad, for being the best father and partner that one could have. We will take this and place it into the casket and place it into the earth with him. And again, it's my honor to be your mouthpiece. Those were your words. Jeremy, I invite you to come forward. It is difficult to sum up somebody's life into a few short minutes, but if you knew my grandpa, he would have done it in a few words. In that regard, I do not share his gift. Grandpa Allen was a great man who did ordinary things extraordinarily well, but the most extraordinary thing he did was find Granny. Since I have been around, his objective was always the same, to make sure she was happy and comfortable, no matter what stage of life they were in. He adored her until the very end, and he leaves a legacy to the next generations of how to treat a partner, how to change for the better, and a lot of other things. When we were in an ambulance on the way back to his apartment from to hospice, when words were very difficult, his mind was not on what was happening to him. He was worried about Granny. He muttered, does Granny know what happened? He was the strongest, most able person I've ever known. 
And while the last few months were incredibly painful and challenging, he was able to bear all of the pain just to have dinner with her every night. If it's all right, I'm gonna share some lessons that grandpa has taught me and a lot of my cousins and siblings, as well as some stories to better contextualize Gramps in a light that I was lucky enough to live in as his grandson. First and foremost, the man loved to eat. You couldn't tell by his figure, but he would truly eat anything you put in front of him, regardless of the time or if he had just finished a meal. Unless they were navy beans, then he would politely shake his head, no. When you ate a meal with grandpa, he tasted your meal to make sure it wasn't poisonous. You finished what you ordered and you tried new things. Typically, these items appeared on a mystery spoon in front of your face with him saying, just try it, because you never know if you like it or not until you tried it. Speaking for my brothers and I, our favorite place to go shopping has been and will always be in Gramps' closet. He was always the best dressed in the room, and if there was something he had that might look better on somebody else, they usually walked out with it by the end of the night. A shirt off your back kind of guy. He even went as far as to buying every grandkid the same sweater that him and Granny had so we could all be wearing the same thing during one of the Jewish holidays. In his own way, that was him saying he loved us. He loved to cook, but he loved to share what he cooked even more, which he imparted on each grandkid by gifting us his famous salad bowl which has enough food for the whole block. When I was in school and came to visit him and Granny, the first question was always about school, what I was studying, and if I had learned anything new. He was a lifelong student and loved to learn, and he loved to talk to all of his grandkids about what we were learning. Grandpa was not just a hungry and smart man, he was athletically gifted as well. He loved to fish, teaching us how to hook a line and always making us take the fish off to complete the job. And he was a very skilled golfer who shot 69 twice in his life, both in the same year. Grandpa and I shared a love for golf and I was lucky enough that during COVID when we were in Florida together, I and some cousins got to play many rounds of golf with him as our caddy. Don't worry, he didn't carry the bag. But golf was more than just a game. It was a metaphor for life to him. It's a simple game if you just put in the appropriate work, you can always improve no matter how good you already are. And of course, nobody threw a better spiral than Gramps. Into his 80s, he threw a better ball than more than half the NFL quarterbacks today, and he'd probably let you know it. He also taught us the importance of choosing our words carefully. In a world of misunderstandings and misinterpretations, there was never an issue with that. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. A good rule of thumb was to never tell him that something was unbelievable, because his reply would always be, well, it can't be unbelievable, because I believe it. He was true to himself, never fake, always direct, which some could have taken as rude. He was just being honest, as he always was. Grandpa appreciated and always welcomed a challenge, whether it was getting his hands dirty and fixing something, making Caesar salad, and enduring a nearly all living hospice. Obstacles were one of the things that made him tick. He was a family man through and through. His contributions to the, hol the Jewish holidays were consistent, always sitting next to Granny, holding her hand with an overflowing plate and a cup filled with red wine or beer. Last week, he did just that, with a plate of chopped liver, gefilte fish, and who knows what else alongside about a half a bottle of red wine. And boy, did he love a cold beer, specifically a Heineken or Kirin, always with a dash of soy sauce or a Guinness. And he loved a Bloody Mary, mostly the tomato juice, always extra spicy. But one of the most important lessons that he taught me in life is that you're never too old to change who you are and that second chances do exist. If you make a mistake, own it, correct it, and move forward, but better. If there was a relationship that I ever wanted to emulate, it was him and Granny. There was nothing he wouldn't do for her until the very end. The love and adoration he had for her was something to try to replicate, but never to be duplicated. And lastly, when you say I love you, mean it. He wasn't the type of person to say I love you every time you walked in or out of a room, but you knew he did. And when he told you, you cherished hearing it and you felt like you just hit the jackpot. I know that when I would hear it, I would brag to my siblings for weeks. I'll miss Gramps a lot. I'll miss her almost daily phone calls. I'll miss throwing a football with him, always being upstaged by his spiral. I will miss being in Florida, eating lox and eggs and onions in the morning, waking up to him usually on the floor with an ab roller and doing push-ups, waiting for a competition. I'll miss him meeting people and challenging them to a throwing competition, regardless of as a friend, an NFL quarterback, or somebody he just ran into. 
I'll miss walking into the room and being greeted with a firm handshake, and I'll miss sitting next to him watching whatever was on the TV just to be together. He was a special man, and we're all better for the time we got to spend with him. I love you, Gramps. You're my guy. The heat drove. There's a beautiful story by O. Henry called The Last Leaf. It's a story that he absolutely loved. It's set in Greenwich Village during the pneumonia epidemic. And it tells the story of an old artist who saves the life of a young neighboring artist dying of pneumonia by giving her the will to live. Through her window, she can see an old ivy growing on a nearby wall, gradually shedding its leaves as autumn turns into winter. And she's taken the thought into her head that she will die when the last leaf falls. The leaves fall day by day, but the last one, the last lone leaf stays on for several days. The ill woman's health quickly recovers. At the story's end, we learn that the old artist who always wanted to produce a masterpiece painting, but never had any success, spent considerable time painting with great realism a leaf on the wall outside for the whole night. Furthermore, the old artist himself dies of pneumonia that he contracted while being out in the cold, wet. And that woman, that young artist, hung on because the leaf never fell, because she kept seeing the the leaf that he painted. Alan loved that story. And as I thought about it, he lived that story. He lived that story every day of his life. He was an artist who created masterpieces, a man who did everything on his own terms. He was creative, he was artistic, he was strong, he was smart, he was really smart. He loved to paint and he loved to sculpt, welding in bronze and steel, painting trees with leaves that truly inspire people. Poetry books and art and nature were his way of celebrating others' creativity. Here was a man who studied art in Vienna, who never suffered fools, who never ever wanted to say goodbye. A man who loved baseball and watching golf, who was so observant of life, thoughtful. He had the presence of someone easygoing and gentle. He was bright, he was humble, he was passionate. He was well, well read and he was insatiably curious. Born to Irving and Lila in 1935 in Chicago, Allen went to school in Texas before coming back to high school. And it was there that he wrote an amazing, amazing letter he saw Diane walking in the hallway and she was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. And she was as nice as she was beautiful. And in the letter, he couldn't wait to hold her hand. She was 15, he was 17. You just made him rewrite that letter so that you have that. And as he said the day before he died, recounting the story, he said, I saw Diane in the hall and I was a goner. He served our country in the Marines as an ad admiral's aide, a true hero. What an honor to have the Marine military honor guard, guard here and hear taps and to see that beautiful American flag folded for all of you. A military presence is a well-deserved honor. He attended school at Illinois and Northwestern before graduating from Roosevelt. He worked in mercantile industries and finance, publishing and insurance. Alan and Diane were married at the Drake, honeymooned in Las Vegas, living on Mozart and then Evanston and then Highland Park and then Northbrook, where Steve, Lisa and Nancy completed their family. He created artwork. I love the fact that he created beautiful trees 
What I love about a tree is it's rooted in the ground. It grows. It grows in so many different directions. It sprouts new leaves. He had that image. He carried that image with him. And so he created beautiful trees at Grove School in Glenview and Willowbrook at Lake Forest. The family had long ties to Unchamet, where your grand great grandfather was a president, Bethel and Highland Park, to Bryn Mawr and to Briarwood. And he was, in every sense, a wonderful father. Alan always played in the Thanksgiving football games. He was the kind of guy that would carve out a chip of the old city wall to bring it back from Israel. You're not allowed to do that, but he did it. He was the kind of guy that would break off a stalactite that had grown in a cave for 2,000 years. He would break off a little piece to give it as a souvenir. And he loved to take silverware from the United Center. <laughs> he had a great sense of humor and boy, could he tell a good joke. You felt good when you were in his presence. Alan and Diane separated and divorced for a few years, but came back together stronger and better than ever because Alan loved Diane more than anything. And in the end, they were always holding hands, newlyweds for the last 20 years. And he hung on for Diane as long as he could, wanting to make sure that she would be okay. He looked to her with love. I love that Will wrote, it was amazing watching him last week at Passover, looking over his family with a contagious grin. He was such a kind-hearted man. He was a man of few words who believed that less is more. But he believed that you should be meaningful in the words that you choose. And don't ever use idioms. Don't say like or um. Grammar was always important. He was stoic. It was never about him. He made it about everyone else. He loved seeing all of you excel in sports and in school. He liked good clothes. He was always nicely dressed. He loved sharing the things that brought him joy with his grandkids, whether that be a perfect bite of food or his favorite t-shirt that he wanted you to wear as well. Billy writes, thanks to him, I force everyone I know to try a bite of food. Every time I will smell uh, kimchi, I will think of him. And when I wear a striped t-shirt, I will always know where I got my fashion style. He taught us to throw a spiral, a perfectly tight spiral. And let's be clear, he had the best spiral in the family, even after his stroke. He taught us to bait a hook, to do a push up like a Marine. And he always asked if there was, he always asked if someone stepped on a duck. And you know when he asked that. Mikey wrote, words mattered to him. He was very literal. He taught me to never be afraid of the ball. He taught me to think outside the box. Pensive is a good word. Thoughtful. What's that? Thoughtful, precise. I will cherish the lessons that he taught us. And so Alan was filled with joy. He was filled with joy and he loved people especially his family, but he loved everyone. He loved the people in his building, the parking attendants and the doormen. He loved meeting new people and saying hi and talking. He was curious. He was a patriot. He was a Zionist and he was a very proud Jew. And there was always a baseball mitt or a football nearby. He was a man who was proud of who he is, was, and will always be. The Talmud asked the question, Mi Ashir, who is rich? And the rabbis of the Talmud debate it and finally agree upon one answer. Mi Ashir, the person who is rich, is the person who is Sameach Bechalko, happy with their individual lot in life. And in the true essence of Judaism, that's what's important. Here was a man who was happy with his lot in life. Alan was not a perfect person, but he always did his best. He was deeply caring for he believed that if you wanted something bad enough, you should go for it. And that 
it's never too late to change. Whatever he did, he wanted to do it well. He believed that one should be the best version of themselves and he was grateful, grateful for all that he had. The answer to play catch was always yes. And boy, did he love garlic. He ate sandwiches with just with green onions and they were the best. He loved kimchi and radishes and had a most amazing team of caregivers these last few years that gave him dignity and enabled him to lead a life with dignity and with purpose and with love. I saw him in the hospital when you as a family didn't think he was gonna make it. You called me to his bedside. The end was here. We said a prayer and he rallied. And every day he got stronger. And then he left the hospital and he came home, much to everyone's surprise. And for these last eight months, he got stronger and more aware, more engaging. And I was able to visit. We talked about everything. He wanted to learn, he wanted to be involved. It was something that I will carry with me as a rabbi that was remarkable. We talked about the holidays and art and Paris and Italy and Israel, where I was headed or where I was coming back from. He had something to offer about everything. We shared hamantash and Purim and a menorah for Hanukkah and macaroons just last week for Passover. And yes, even once he asked for a ball that was over by his, by his side of his bed. And he told me to take a few steps back just so that I could see that perfect spiral. He watched old movies and we talked Torah. He loved watching services. We said his name and Diane's name at each service for healing and strength. And that brought him great comfort. Like all of you, I'm sure you'll miss so much of what made him so special, but you'll carry that with you for the rest of your lives. But we know that Passover, which comes to an end today or for some of us yesterday, Passover is really all about freedom. The freedom to go from the narrow spaces of the world to the open spaces. During Passover, he truly lived the Exodus as he let go, peacefully, gently. He let go without any fanfare. He let go. His work on this earth was done. It wasn't a struggle. Alan's body is now returned to the earth. But what makes us who we are is not a body, but a soul. His soul, the essence of who he is, was, and will always be, lives on. Lisa, I, I think you might have given him a book by Jonathan Sachs or someone, someone gave him a book by Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and he loved to study Torah and to read what J Rabbi Sachs was writing. And so I brought him another book to, to learn and to, to hold on to. Rabbi Sachs said it best. We are embodied souls. We are flesh and blood. We grow old. We lose those we love. Outwardly, we struggle to maintain our composure, but inwardly, we weep, we cry. Yet, life goes on. And what we begin, others will continue. Those we loved and lost live on in us. And we will live on in those we love. For love is as strong as death. And the good we do never dies. The good we do never dies. Love is stronger than death. Rudyard Kipling wrote an amazing poem called If. If you think about it, the word if is right there in the middle of the word life, L-I-F-E. We never know, but right there is the word if. This poem is just so beautiful. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you and make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting 
We're being lied about. Don't deal in lies. We're being hated. Don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and make dreams your, and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of a pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginning and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can walk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but not too much. If you can fix the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of a distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Here was a man who can talk with crowds and kept his virtue and walked with kings and never lost his common touch. Here was a man who made life better, 100%. Here was a man, as it says in Dr. Seuss's Horton Hatches the Egg, I meant what I said and said what I meant, on elephants faithful, 100%. May he rest in peace. Lahitra Oat. Lahitra Oat means see you soon. The body is returned to this family crypt here at this beautiful cemetery, this memorial park. Together we will recite the together we will recite the mourner's Kaddish. We will ask God to watch over his soul. And then we will sprinkle some earth from the land of Israel into the crypt, knowing that we're hoping and praying for a world truly at peace, a world truly without any pain, without any suffering, without diseases like Lewy body dementia and without strokes and cancer and all those other things that we face, without pneumonia and COVID and all the other things we hope and pray for. We hope and pray for that messianic moment, that messianic time. And so we give back to those we love. And since the Messiah will come to Jerusalem first, we add earth from the land of Israel, from Jerusalem to every burial outside of the land of Israel. And here was a man who loved, who loved Israel. And I love the donations to Hebrew University or to Magan David Dome or to Jewish National Fund, organizations that are so meaningful to him and to all of you. And so we rise and we ask for God to watch over the soul of Alan. El Malay Rachamin, Shochein Bam Romim, Hamsein Menucha Nechona, Tachat Kanfei Ashkina. Yim Kedoshima Teharim Kezohar Harakia Mazirim Et Nishmat Avram Ben Yitzchak Shalach Lolamo God full of compassion dwelling in the heights and the depths Grant perfect rest under the wings of your presence To an incredible father and father-in-law To an amazing husband To a grandfather To a relative to a friend to an in-law to someone who made this world better by the way he lived by the way he laughed by the way he loved who has now entered eternity may he find refuge forever under the shadow of god's wings may his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life god is his inheritance may he rest in peace and let us all say amen the dust returns to the earth the spirit returns to god who gave it and so we say the mourners cottage together Yit gadal v'yit gadash shamei rabba ve'alma divrach hirute v'yamlich machute v'chayechon v'yomechon uv'chaye d'kol beit Yisrael v'agala v'zman kari v'imru amen yehe shmei rabba mavarach le'olam omel maya yit barach v'yishtabach v'yit pa'ar v'yit roman v'yit naseh v'yit hadar v'yit tale v'yit talal shmei d'kud shab rifu La Ela min kol birchata vashirata, tush bachata vanechamata, da miran be alma bimru amin. 
Yehei Shlama Rabba Min Shamaya, Vachayim Alenu Be'al Kol Yisrael, Bimru Amen. Ose Shalom Bimromav, Huya Se Shalom, Alenu Be'al Kol Yisrael, Bimru Amen. May the source of peace and peace to all who mourn and comfort all who are bereaved and let us say, Amen. Ose Shalom Bimromav, Huya Se Shalom Alenu. Go your way, for God has called you. Go your way, may God be with you. May your righteousness go before you and the glory of God receive you. May God comfort you among all the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. Amen. Please be seated. It takes just a few moments for the cemetery workers to return the, the, the casket to the crypt. There are some flowers here. If you'd like to place maybe a, a, a tulip a petal into the, into the grave, that would be beautiful. If you'd love to uh, place just a, a piece of earth into the into the into the corner, you can do that as well. If I can have the grandchildren just come forward for one moment, I'm going to help just lift his casket and help the gentleman from the cemetery. The shiva will be at the Edelson residence at 3010 Floral Drive in Northbrook today from 2:30 to 8 p.m. Friday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Memorial contributions to the American Friends of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the Jewish National Fund, the American Friends of my game, David Adon. For those of you who are in attendance, that information is on the service folder. For those of you who are joining us via live stream, that information is for our Shiva and donations can be found on the Funeral Homes website. At this time, we are going to stop the live stream. The family appreciates you in attendance. We'll continue with the entombment. Shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. As we say during this time of year, Dayenu, it would have been enough. Had he married the woman of his dreams, Dayenu, but he married her twice. <laughs> had he had three beautiful children, Dayenu, but they each married three beautiful children. And so his family grew to six, Dayenu. These amazing grandchildren, each one had your own unique and wonderful relationship with them, Dayenu. To family and friends, to wonderful sporting events, to shoot a 69 not once but twice, Dayenu. And so we, uh, we honor him with these, uh, at this spirit of Passover with these words, Dayenu. Die, Dayenu, die, Dayenu, die, Dayenu. family to take back to the Shiva house. This concludes the services here at the cemetery.